This is a LibriVox recording. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. Today's reading by Kristen McQuillan. Frankenstein, by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, Chapter Fourteen. Some time elapsed before I learned the history of my friends. It was one which could not fail to impress itself deeply on my mind, unfolding as it did in a number of circumstances, each interesting and wonderful to one so utterly inexperienced as I was. The name of the old man was De Lacy. He was descended from a good family in France, where he had lived for many years in affluence, respected by his superiors and beloved by his equals. His son was bred in the service of his country, and Agatha had ranked with ladies of the highest distinction. A few months before my arrival, they had lived in a large and luxurious city called Paris, surrounded by friends and possessed of every enjoyment which virtue, refinement of intellect, or taste, accompanied by a moderate fortune, could afford. The father of Safi had been the cause of their ruin. He was a Turkish merchant, and had inhabited Paris for many years, when, for some reason which I could not learn, he became obnoxious to the government. He was seized and cast into prison the very day that Safi arrived from Constantinople to join him. He was tried and condemned to death. The injustice of his sentence was very flagrant. All Paris was indignant, and it was judged that his religion and wealth, rather than the crime alleged against him, had been the cause of his condemnation. Felix had accidentally been present at the trial. His horror and indignation were uncontrollable when he heard the decision of the court. He made at that moment a solemn vow to deliver him. And then looked around for the means. After many fruitless attempts to gain admittance to the prison, he found a strongly grated window in an unguarded part of the building, which lighted the dungeon of the unfortunate Mohammedan, who, loaded with chains, waited in despair the execution of the barbarous sentence. Felix visited the grate at night and made known to the prisoner his intentions in his favor. The Turk, amazed and delighted, endeavored to rekindle the zeal of his deliverer by promises of reward and wealth. Felix rejected his offers with contempt. Yet when he saw the lovely Safi, who was allowed to visit her father and who by her gestures expressed her lively gratitude, the youth could not help owning to his own mind that the captive possessed a treasure which would fully reward his toil and hazard. The Turk quickly perceived the impression that his daughter had made on the heart of Felix, and endeavored to secure him more entirely in his interests by the promise of her hand in marriage so soon as he should be conveyed to a place of safety. Felix was too delicate to accept this offer, yet he looked forward to the probability of the event as to the consummation of his happiness. During the ensuing days, while the preparations were going forward for the escape of the merchant, the zeal of Felix was warmed by several letters that he received from this lovely girl. Who found means to express her thoughts in the language of her lover by the aid of an old man, a servant of her father who understood French? She thanked him in the most ardent terms for his intended services toward her parent, and at the same time she gently deplored her own fate. I have copies of this letters, for I found means during my residence in the hovel to procure implements of writing, and the letters were often in the hands of Felix or Agatha. Before I depart, I will give them to you. They will prove the truth of my tale. But at present, as the sun is already far declined, I shall only have time to repeat the substance of them to you. Safi related that her mother was a Christian Arab, seized and made a slave by the Turks. Recommended by her beauty, she had won the heart of the father of Safi, who married her. The young girl spoke in high and enthusiastic terms of her mother, who, born in freedom, spurned the bondage to which she was now reduced. She instructed her daughter in the tenets of her religion and taught her to aspire to higher powers of intellect and an independence of spirit forbidden to the female followers of Mohammed. This lady died, but her lessons were indelibly impressed on the mind of Safi, who sickened at the prospect of again returning to Asia and being immured within the walls of a harem, allowed only to occupy herself with infantile amusements ill suited to the temper of her soul, now accustomed to grand ideas and a noble emulation for virtue. The prospect of marrying a Christian and remaining in a country where women were allowed to take a rank in society was enchanting to her. The day for the execution of the Turk was fixed, but on the night previous to it he quitted his prison and before morning was distant many leagues from Paris. Felix had procured passports in the name of his father, sister, and himself. He had previously communicated his plan to the former, 
who aided the deceit by quitting his house under the pretense of a journey, and concealed himself with his daughter in an obscure part of Paris. Felix conducted the fugitives through France to Lyon, and across Mount Cenis to Leghorn, where the merchant had decided to wait a favorable opportunity of passing into some part of the Turkish dominions. Safi resolved to remain with her father until the moment of his departure, before which time the Turk renewed his promise that she should be united to his deliverer, and Felix remained with them in expectation of that event, and in the meantime he enjoyed the society of the Arabian, who exhibited toward him the simplest and tenderest affection. They conversed with one another through the means of an interpreter, and sometimes with the interpretation of looks, and Safi sang to him the divine airs of her native country. The Turk allowed this intimacy to take place, and encouraged the hopes of the youthful lovers, while in his heart he had formed far other plans. He loathed the idea that his daughter should be united to a Christian, but he feared the resentment of Felix if he should appear lukewarm, for he knew that he was still in the power of his deliverer if he should choose to betray him to the Italian state which they inhabited. He revolved a thousand plans by which he should be enabled to prolong the deceit until it might be no longer necessary, and secretly to take his daughter with him when he departed. His plans were facilitated by the news which arrived from Paris. The government of France were greatly enraged at the escape of their victim, and spared no pains to detect and punish his deliverer. The plot of Felix was quickly discovered, and de Lacy and Agatha were thrown into prison. The news reached Felix, and roused him from his dream of pleasure. His blind and aged father and his gentle sister lay in a noisome dungeon while he enjoyed the free air and the society of her whom he loved. This idea was torture to him. He quickly arranged with the Turk that if the latter should find a favorable opportunity for escape before Felix could return to Italy, Safi should remain as a boarder at a convent in Leghorn, and then, quitting the lovely Arabian, he hastened to Paris and delivered himself up to the vengeance of the law, hoping to free de Lacy and Agatha by this proceeding. He did not succeed. They remained confined for five months before the trial took place, the result of which deprived them of their fortune and condemned them to a perpetual exile from their native country. They found a miserable asylum in the cottage in Germany, where I discovered them. Felix soon learned that the treacherous Turk, for whom he and his family endured such unheard-of oppression, on discovering that his deliverer was thus reduced to poverty and ruin, became a traitor to good feeling and honor, and had quitted Italy with his daughter, insultingly sending Felix a pittance of money to aid him, as he said, in some plan of future maintenance. Such were the events that preyed on the heart of Felix, and rendered him, when I first saw him, the most miserable of his family. He could have endured poverty, and while this distress had been the meed of his virtue, he gloried in it. But the ingratitude of the Turk and the loss of his beloved safety were misfortunes more bitter and irreparable. The arrival of the Arabian now infused new life into his soul. When the news reached Leghorn that Felix was deprived of his wealth and rank, the merchant commanded his daughter to think no more of her lover, but to prepare to return to her native country. The generous nature of Safi was outraged by this command. She attempted to expostulate with her father, but he left her angrily, reiterating his tyrannical mandate. A few days after, the Turk entered his daughter's apartment and told her hastily that he had reason to believe that his residence at Leghorn had been divulged, and he should speedily be delivered up to the French government. He had consequently hired a vessel to convey him to Constantinople, for which city he should sail in a few hours. He intended to leave his daughter under the care of a confidential servant, to follow at her leisure with the greater part of his property, which had not yet arrived at Leghorn. When alone, Safe resolved in her own mind the plan of conduct that it would become her to pursue in this emergency. A residence in Turkey was abhorrent to her. Her religion and her feelings were alike averse to it. By some papers of her father, which fell into her hands, she heard of the exile of her lover, and learnt the name of the spot where he then resided. She hesitated some time, but at length she formed her determination. Taking with her some jewels that belonged to her, and a sum of money, she quitted Italy with an attendant, a native of Leghorn, but who understood the common language of Turkey, and departed for Germany. She arrived in safety at a town about twenty leagues from the cottage of de Lacy, when her attendant fell dangerously ill. Safi nursed her with the most devoted affection, but the poor girl died, and the Arabian was left alone, unacquainted with the language of the country, and utterly ignorant of the customs of the world. She fell, however, into good hands. 
the Italian had mentioned the name of the spot for which they were bound, and after her death the woman of the house in which they lived took care that Safi should arrive in safety at the cottage of her lover. Chapter 15 Such was the history of my beloved cottagers. It impressed me deeply. I learned from the views of social life which it developed to admire their virtues and to deprecate the vices of mankind. As yet I looked upon crime as a distant evil, benevolence and generosity were ever present before me, inciting within me a desire to become an actor in the busy scene where so many admirable qualities were called forth and displayed. But in giving an account of the progress of my intellect, I must not omit a circumstance which occurred in the beginning of the month of August of the same year. One night, during my accustomed visit to the neighboring woods, where I collected my own food and brought home firing for my protectors, I found on the ground a leathern portmanteau containing several articles of dress and some books. I eagerly seized the prize, and returned with it to my hovel. Fortunately, the books were written in the language, the elements of which I had acquired at the cottage. They consisted of Paradise Lost, a volume of Plutarch's Lives, and The Sorrows of Werther. The possession of these treasures gave me extreme delight. I now continually studied and exercised my mind upon these histories, whilst my friends were employed in their ordinary occupations. I can hardly describe to you the effect of these books. They produced in me an infinity of new images and feelings, that sometimes raised me to ecstasy, but more frequently sunk me into the lowest dejection. In The Sorrows of Werther, besides the interest of its simple and affecting story, so many opinions are canvassed, and so many lights thrown upon what had hitherto been to me obscure subjects, that I found in it a never-ending source of speculation and astonishment. The gentle and domestic manners it described, combined with lofty sentiments and feelings, which had for their object something out of self, accorded well with my experience among my protectors, and with the wants which were for ever alive in my own bosom. But I thought Werther himself was a more divine being than I had ever beheld or imagined. His character contained no pretension, but it sank deep. The disquisitions upon death and suicide were calculated to fill me with wonder. I did not pretend to enter into the merits of the case, yet I inclined towards the opinions of the hero, whose extinction I wept without precisely understanding it. As I read, however, I applied much personally to my own feelings and condition. I found myself similar, yet at the same time strangely unlike to the beings concerning whom I read, and to whose conversation I was a listener. I sympathized with, and partly understood them, but I was unformed in mind. I was dependent on none, and related to none. The path of my departure was free, and there was none to lament my annihilation. My person was hideous, and my stature gigantic. What did this mean? Who was I? What was I? Whence did I come? What was my destination? These questions continually recurred, but I was unable to solve them. The volume of Plutarch's Lives, which I possessed, contained the histories of the first founders of the ancient republics. This book had a far different effect on me from the sorrows of Werther. I learned from Werther's imaginations despondency and gloom, but Plutarch taught me high thoughts. He elevated me above the wretched sphere of my own reflections, to admire and love the heroes of past ages. Many things I read surpassed my understanding and experience. I had a very confused knowledge of kingdoms, wide extents of country, mighty rivers and boundless seas, but I was perfectly unacquainted with towns and large assemblages of men. The cottage of my protectors had been the only school in which I had studied human nature, but this book developed new and mightier scenes of action. I read of men concerned in public affairs, governing or massacring their species. I felt the greatest ardor for virtue rise within me, an abhorrence for vice, as far as I understood the signification of those terms, relative as they were, as I applied them, to pleasure and pain alone. Induced by these feelings, I was of course led to admire peaceable lawgivers, Numa, Solon, and Lycurgus, in preference to Romulus and Theseus. The patriarchal lives of my protectors caused these impressions to take a firm hold on my mind, Perhaps, if my first introduction to humanity had been made by a young soldier burning for glory and slaughter, I should have been imbued with different sensations. But Paradise Lost excited different and far deeper emotions. I read it, as I'd read the other volumes which had fallen into my hands, as a true history. 
it moved every feeling of wonder and awe that the picture of an omnipotent god warring with his creatures was capable of exciting. I often referred the several situations, as their similarity struck me, to my own. Like Adam, I was apparently united by no link to any other being in existence. But his state was far different from mine in every other respect. He had come forth from the hands of a god, a perfect creature, happy and prosperous, guarded by the especial care of his creator. He was allowed to converse with and acquire knowledge from beings of a superior nature, but I was wretched, helpless, and alone. Many times I considered Satan as the fitter emblem of my condition, for often, like him, when I viewed the bliss of my protectors, the bitter gall of envy rose within me. Another circumstance strengthened and confirmed these feelings. Soon after my arrival in the hovel, I discovered some papers in the pocket of the dress which I had taken from your laboratory. At first I had neglected them, but now that I was able to decipher the characters in which they were written, I began to study them with diligence. It was your journal of the four months that preceded my creation. You minutely described in these papers every step you took in the progress of your work. This history was mingled with accounts of domestic occurrences. You doubtless recollect these papers. Here they are. Everything is related in them which bears reference to my accursed origin. The whole detail of that series of disgusting circumstances which produced it is set in view. The minutest description of my odious and loathsome person is given, in language which painted your own horrors and rendered mine indelible. I sickened as I read. "'Hateful day when I receive life!' I exclaimed in agony. "'Accursed creator, why did you form a monster so hideous that even you turned from me in disgust?' God in pity made man beautiful and alluring after his own image, but my form is a filthy type of yours, more horrid even from the very resemblance. Satan had his companions, fellow devils, to admire and encourage him, but I am solitary and abhorred. These were the reflections of my hours of despondency and solitude, but when I contemplated the virtues of the cottagers, their amiable and benevolent dispositions, I persuaded myself that when they should become acquainted with my admiration of their virtues, they would compassionate me, and overlook my personal deformity. Could they turn from their door one, however monstrous, who solicited their compassion and friendship? I resolved at least not to despair, but in every way to fit myself for an interview with them which would decide my fate. I postponed this attempt for some months longer, for the importance attached to its success inspired me with a dread lest I should fail." Besides, I found that my understanding improved so much with every day's experience that I was unwilling to commence this undertaking until a few more months could have added to my sagacity. Several changes in the meantime took place in the cottage. The presence of Safi diffused happiness among its inhabitants, and I also found that a greater degree of plenty reigned there. Felix and Agatha spent more time in amusement and conversation, and were assisted in their labors by servants. They did not appear rich— but they were contented and happy. Their feelings were serene and peaceful, while mine became every day more tumultuous. Increase of knowledge only discovered to me more clearly what a wretched outcast I was. A cherished hope, it's true, but it vanished when I beheld my person reflected in water or my shadow in the moonshine, even as that frail image and that inconstant shade. I endeavored to crush these fears, and to fortify myself for the trial which in a few months I resolved to undergo, and sometimes I allowed my thoughts, unchecked by reason, to ramble in the fields of paradise, and dared to fancy amiable and lovely creatures sympathizing with my feelings and cheering my gloom, their angelic countenances breathed smiles of consolation. But it was all a dream. No eve soothed my sorrows, nor shared my thoughts. I was alone." I remembered Adam's supplication to his Creator, but where was mine? He had abandoned me, and in the bitterness of my heart I cursed him. Autumn passed thus. I saw with surprise and grief the leaves decay and fall, and nature again assumed the barren and bleak appearance it had worn when I first beheld the woods and the lovely moon. Yet I did not heed the bleakness of the weather. I was better fitted by my confirmation for the endurance of cold than heat. But my chief delights were the sight of the flowers, the birds, and all the gay apparel of summer. When those deserted me, I turned with more attention towards the cottagers. Their happiness was not decreased by the absence of summer. They loved and sympathized with one another, and their joys, depending on each other, were not interrupted by the casualties that took place around them. 
The more I saw of them, the greater became my desire to claim their protection and kindness. My heart yearned to be known and loved by these amiable creatures, to see their sweet looks directed towards me with affection was the utmost limit of my ambition. I dared not think that they would turn them from me with disdain and horror. The poor that stopped at their door were never driven away. I asked, it is true, for greater treasures than a little food or rest. I required kindness and sympathy, but I did not believe myself utterly unworthy of it. The winter advanced, and an entire revolution of the seasons had taken place since I awoke into life. My attention at this time was solely directed towards my plan of introducing myself into the cottage of my protectors. I revolved many projects, but that on which I finally fixed was to enter the dwelling when the blind old man should be alone. I had sagacity enough to discover that the unnatural hideousness of my person was the chief object of horror with those who had formerly beheld me. My voice, although harsh, had nothing terrible in it. I thought, therefore, that if in the absence of his children I could gain the good will and mediation of the old de Lacy, I might by his means be tolerated by my younger protectors. One day, when the sun shone on the red leaves that strewed the ground and diffused cheerfulness, although it denied warmth, Safie, Agatha, and Felix departed on a long country walk, and the old man, at his own desire, was left alone in the cottage. When his children had departed, he took up his guitar and played several mournful but sweet airs, more sweet and mournful than I had ever heard him play before. At first his countenance was illuminated with pleasure, but as he continued, thoughtfulness and sadness succeeded. At length, laying aside the instrument, he sat absorbed in reflection. My heart beat quick. This was the hour and moment of trial, which would decide my hopes or realize my fears. The servants were gone to a neighboring fair. All was silent in and around the cottage. It was an excellent opportunity. Yet when I proceeded to execute my plan, my limbs failed me, and I sank to the ground. Again I rose, and exerting all the firmness of which I was master, removed the planks which I had placed before my hovel to conceal my retreat. The fresh air revived me, and with renewed determination I approached the door of their cottage. I knocked. "'Who is there?' said the old man. "'Come in.' I entered. "'Pardon this intrusion,' I said. "'I'm a traveller in want of a little rest. You would greatly oblige me if you would allow me to remain a few minutes before the fire.' "'Enter,' said de Lacy, "'and I will try in what manner I can to relieve your wants. But, unfortunately, my children are from home, and as I'm blind I'm afraid I should find it difficult to procure food for you.' "'Oh, do not trouble yourself, my kind host. I have food. It is warmth and rest only that I need.' I sat down, and a silence ensued. I knew that every minute was precious to me, yet I remained irresolute in what manner to commence the interview. When the old man addressed me, "'By your language, stranger, I suppose you are my countryman. You are French?' "'No, but I was educated by a French family, and understand that language only.' I am now going to claim the protection of some friends, whom I sincerely love, and of whose favour I have some hopes. Are they Germans? No, they are French, but let us change the subject. I am an unfortunate and deserted creature. I look around, and I have no relation or friend upon earth. These amiable people to whom I go have never seen me, and know little of me. I am full of fears, for if I fail there, I am an outcast in the world for ever. Oh, do not despair! To be friendless is indeed unfortunate, but the hearts of men, when unprejudiced by any obvious self-interest, are full of brotherly love and charity. Rely, therefore, on your hopes, and if these friends are good and amiable, do not despair. They are kind, they are the most excellent creatures in the world, but unfortunately they are prejudiced against me. I have good dispositions, my life has been hitherto harmless and in some degree beneficial, but a fatal prejudice clouds their eyes and where they ought to see a feeling and kind friend, they behold only a detestable monster. That is indeed unfortunate, but if you are really blameless, cannot you undeceive them? I am about to undertake that task, and it is on that account that I feel so many overwhelming terrors. I tenderly love these friends. I have, unknown to them, been for many months in the habits of daily kindness toward them, but they believe that I wish to injure them, and that is the prejudice which I wish to overcome. Where do these friends reside? Near this spot. The old man paused, and then continued, If you will unreservedly confide to me the particulars of your tale, I perhaps may be of use in undeceiving them. 
I am blind, and cannot judge of your countenance, but there is something in your words which persuades me that you are sincere. I am poor and in exile, but it will afford me true pleasure to be in any way serviceable to a human creature. Excellent man! I thank you and accept your generous offer. You raise me from the dust by this kindness, and I trust that by your aid I shall not be driven from the society and sympathy of your fellow creatures. Heaven forbid, even if you were really criminal, for that can only drive you to desperation and not instigate you to virtue. I also am unfortunate. I and my family have been condemned, although innocent. Judge, therefore, if I do not feel for your misfortunes. How can I thank you, my best and only benefactor? From your lips first have I heard the voice of kindness directed toward me. I shall be forever grateful, and your present humanity assures me of success with those friends whom I am on the point of meeting. May I know the names and residence of those friends? I paused. This, I thought, was the moment of decision, which was to rob me of or bestow happiness on me forever. I struggled vainly for firmness sufficient to answer him, but the effort destroyed all my remaining strength. I sank on the chair and sobbed aloud. At that moment I heard the steps of my younger protectors. I had not a moment to lose, but seizing the hand of the old man, I cried, Now is the time. Save and protect me. You and your family are the friends whom I seek. Do not you desert me in the hour of trial. Great God! exclaimed the old man. Who are you? At that instant the cottage door was opened, and Felix, Safi, and Agatha entered. Who can describe their horror and consternation on beholding me? Agatha fainted, and Safi, unable to attend to her friend, rushed out of the cottage. Felix started forward, and with supernatural force tore me from his father, to whose knees I clung. In a transport of fury he dashed me to the ground and struck me violently with a stick. I could have torn him limb from limb as the lion rends the antelope, but my heart sank within me as with bitter sickness, and I refrained. I saw him on the point of repeating his blow, when, overcome by pain and anguish, I quitted the cottage, and in the general tumult escaped unperceived to my hovel. End of chapter 15